And welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. We're always praying for you, our EWTN family. Of course, the first week of Advent as we move through the Advent season rolling into the Christmas season. I'm Doug Keck reminding you how important you are to this program. Email us your questions, send us questions through Facebook, tweet us through Twitter. And for all those things related to Father Spitzer's, there's the Magic Center website. His knowledge cannot be contained in one website. So we have two websites. The other one is CredibleCatholic.com. Today's show topic, the Eucharistic commemoration in the first century. What was the, how did the early church deal with those things? And speaking of something I think is really worth learning about, we've got Mother Angelica's got a wonderful set of books. These are the book of the month for EW10, the spiritual wisdom of Mother Angelica box set. Also, couldn't be contained in one book, but can be contained in this box set. So you should check that out as EW10RC.com is the place to check that out. You want to talk about a wonderful gift for somebody you love for Christmas. It couldn't be better than this box set of Mother Angelica's writings, which were all written longhand on a yellow legal pad sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament. So you know the kind of insights that uh, you'll get by reading her work and again through our religious catalog. With that being said, we turn once again to Father Spitzer. Great to see you, my friend. And good to see you too, Doug. So uh, how, was your th how was your Thanksgiving? It was terrific, as always. Uh, uh, I love uh, visiting my family. <laughs> right, exactly. And we hope for all of our EW10 family. So if you'd like to kick us off with a prayer, that'd be great. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, particularly the blessing of this ministry. And um, ask um, the Lord, I ask you, Lord, to bless us in our uh, ministry, uh, inspiring us, protecting us, and guiding us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom. Pray for us. Pray for us. Amen. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we're, we're here in the first week of Advent. And let me ask you, a lot of times in the world we're living in today, heavy commercialization. We all talk about the fact that, you know, they're playing Christmas music uh, the day after Halloween. Mm -hmm. If they wait that long at the, this point in time, yeah. uh, we, we see that happening. So how does somebody, how do you yourself, maybe you can give us some tips, try to keep that Advent aspect of the next four weeks basically leading up to Christmas without just sliding right into the Christmas season? Well, you know, some of it, uh, you almost have to slide into the Christmas season because you've got the, uh, the little problem of Christmas cards and, right. you know, you have to pick up a few things for uh, people. And um, so I, I try to just focus on um, the religious part of Christmas and, and focus particularly in my um, morning prayer and um, you know on, on the we have what's called a breviary and, and uh, it's you know really appropriate to the Advent season the mm -hmm. whole book of readings the the entire all the antiphons are, are really directed at mm -hmm. Advent and then of course if you go to daily mass and certainly Sunday mm -hmm. mass all the readings and again the the homily frequently mm -hmm. enough is geared toward Advent and so uh, um, I just have a, a very right. natural proclivity to do it as a priest. Those who really don't have a breviary mm -hmm. probably have a tougher time keeping focused mm -hmm. uh, because you've got the liturgy alone and if you don't mm -hmm. go to daily mass it, it, it's, a, it's a little harder. But I would say just be uh, intentional. And if you get this, uh, there's a little book that's called the Magnificat. It, it, right. You know, you can subscribe to it and so forth. If you actually subscribe to that, they really do have all the ad Advent antiphons in there and Advent uh, special Advent readings, things of that nature right. that can really help you to keep focused uh, on the season. You can also get some of these things from the USCCB website. There's some good meditations right. and things of that nature as well. Right. So um, uh, you, you just have to really be intentional and you have right. to look for it. But there are some really good reflections on, uh, on the website. But I think EWTN also has uh, some good uh, reflections on Advent on well, their website. Well, we have website. that new book that we so, just came out with uh, that has to do with going through Advent, of course, and the Magnificat yep, you can yeah. get through our religious catalog as well. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Uh, that that'd be the uh, 
the, the perfect solution. All right. Let me ask you, uh, you, and you always talk about your mom obviously having a big impact, it yeah. seems, on your your upbringing as a Catholic. What about, was the Advent wreath an important part of your family? Did, was that one of the practices you did? We didn't actually have the, we had the Advent wreath at church, of course, mm -hmm. but we didn't do it at home. Uh, what we had were these little Dutch Advent calendars. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, every day, you know, um, or every evening, I should say, my, when my father came in to tuck us into bed, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, well, you'd open another door mm -hmm. and there would be, a, you know, behind the door something that reminded you of Advent. And it was generally particular to the religious celebration mm -hmm. of Advent. On occasion, there might be something that was uh, not so much religious, mm -hmm. but by and large, okay. it, was, it had a religious significance to it. And so, we, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, we got all excited about the opening of the next the door. little... Uh, door there, you know, on the calendar, and what was the surprise behind it, and it would generally be uh, something religious, something that would right. remind us of, of Advent, and, and that was pretty much uh, what we did. Right, so, I know. Um, we tended uh, to have the one with the chocolate behind the door, which was also, uh, along with the reading, <laughs> a little chocolate treat there at the same time. <laughs> but it is the great ways you can kind of keep your kids at least yeah. focused on Advent as well. So let's let's talk about some right. questions we've got uh, before we get into the topic Eucharistic commemoration of the first century. We'll get into that. Here's a question from a prior program we didn't get to. Dear Father Spitzer, I did some bad things years ago, which I confess, but I'm still deeply ashamed of them. It could become so strong that it's sometimes debilitating. Could part of it be the devil reminding me of what I did to try and prevent me from getting closer to God? Any words of advice would be greatly appreciated. Mike from Toronto. Mike, I got to tell you, just about every saint went through what you are going through. E even though the saints recognized the, the definitive power of absolution in the sacrament of reconciliation, they also had this difficulty of sort of reliving these things again and again because it, it, as you grow in your spiritual life, as you grow ever closer to the Lord, you feel worse about your sins over the course of time. You, you really didn't know even how bad it was when you were committing them. And then all of a sudden, the closer you grow to our, our Lord and, and, to, and to his blessed mother, mm -hmm. the more and more it, it kind of intensifies. Oh my gosh, what did I do? Mm -hmm. uh, I've gone through it myself. Now, you know, there's two ways to look at this. I, I count it as a blessing up to that point, right? So when I you feel that sense of, oh my gosh, you know, it really was much worse than I thought. You know, what have I done? Did I undermine the kingdom of God? What have I done here? Or something like that. Way back when, even if it was 30 years ago, I suddenly remember something that was colossally dumb. And so then you can f find some, you really have some guilt there. But the point is, when you cross that line, from just saying, oh my gosh, now I know how serious this was. Lord, I'm so sorry. That's not bad because you really do feel that contrition again. You really do want to, to tell the Lord you, you really didn't mean it. You didn't even know how serious this was. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, just you know, run right into his arms. That's what I do. I just literally say, Lord, I'm just running into your arms here. Just hold me. You know, and and uh, and I do that. I mean, I literally do that, and sometimes I actually feel like the Lord just is taking me and mm -hmm. and holding me when when I'm doing that. Now that's one thing, and that's okay, and that's healthy, Mike. Uh, what's not healthy is when you cross the line mm -hmm. and say something like, "I can never forgive myself," mm -hmm. or instead of running into the arms of Christ who's, you know, kind of holding you and just saying, don't worry, I'm taking care of it, I have taken care of it. You know, I want you now to go into the future. You know, th this is what you, you have to do. But instead of having that view of God or that view of Jesus holding you, instead maybe you have a view of God that goes, you know, uh, something like, yeah, you really didn't know mm -hmm. how bad it was and it was really bad. 
and, and quite frankly, you're on the borderline of being unforgivable. Mm. And so all of a sudden, you start having this notion of God who is kind of an ogre, who is just, instead of saying, you know, um, you know I forgive you, I, I, I'm supporting you, I want you to go into the future, you have a view of God who is just lording it over you and saying, you did not feel near as guilty as you should have felt mm -hmm. the first time around. Now take some of this. If that's your view of God, that, as you correctly pointed out, Michael, is the devil. Mm -hmm. And he comes as the accuser. He comes to separate you from God. He wants to make you feel so ashamed and so guilty that you cannot possibly turn to God and face him. Mm -hmm. If you've got that view, what I'm just asking you to do is trust me. Just say to the Lord, I would like to run right into your arms mm -hmm. and please hold me. I don't, can't justify myself. You justify me. And so at that juncture, just run into his arms and let him hold you. That's what I do mm -hmm. because I cannot justify myself. And these things are going to happen, and you're going to feel sincere regret on deeper and deeper levels as you grow closer to the Lord. It just can't be, right. you know, that's part of the natural maturation in the spiritual right. life. So just, uh, uh, you know, just do that. Force yourself to do that. And don't worry, one of these days as you're running into the arms of the Lord, maybe almost immediately, you're mm -hmm. gonna sense that the Lord is holding you mm -hmm. just like that beautiful Rembrandt painting. I don't know if you ever saw that before, but it was uh, the prodigal son by oh, yes, Rembrandt. Right, right. And, and the look on the father's face as, as he's holding this right. boy, right? Now, just remember, that boy has done everything bad. I mean, he, you know, betrayed his country, betrayed his family, betrayed the Torah, betrayed God, lived with the pigs, ritually impure. The guy is, you know, from any, you know, vantage point of first century Judaism, uh, he, he's a total loss. Mm -hmm. But not to the father. The father, you know, if you look at that Rembrandt painting and just study it, it's called Rembrandt's Prodigal Son. The, look at the father's eyes and look at his hands gripping his boy and he's got him back, back now right, right. and he's just holding him, really gripping him almost, uh, you know, with this masculine hand and this gentle feminine hand that's intentionally painted there by Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. Just, just run into the arms of that God right. with that face who's just in complete joy that his son is back. That's you. You couldn't be any worse than the prodigal son. I assure you right. that uh, the, the prodigal son was pretty much a total loss in terms of everything you could do bad in first century did Judaism. Well, so he did it's it interesting too that you, you didn't do it. Yeah, you brought that up because that was, that's the uh, painting that's on the set of the Journey Home Show for Marcus Grodi and has been for many years. Oh yeah. He actually requested that we have that so that, uh, you know, kind of re reflective as well about the continuing journey people are yeah. on uh, into the Catholic Church. The other thing I was thinking about, and, I, and I've quoted you many yeah. times, uh, mm -hmm. ho hopefully with assignation, uh, that uh, <laughs> the idea of when you say, who are you listening to? When you have that voice that's talking mm -hmm. to you, you talk about with you, when your own priesthood and things like that, that whole idea, who mm -hmm. are you listening to? If you're being brought down or being torn down, that's not God. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. That that incident, that little story I told about my provincial, mm -hmm. you know, I had just gotten, you know, the word that I, I had a serious eye problem. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to tell my provincial, you know, six months before my ordination, I got to let them know, uh, you know, I'm damaged goods. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm thinking, right? So the word damaged goods, by the way, that's not God's words. That's, mm -hmm. that's the devil's words. Mm -hmm. But I had fully appropriated the devil's rhetoric at that point. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I better, you know, tell him. And it so happens I run into the provincial right as I'm walking down the corridor because I'm back in the United States from Rome trying to go to a retinal specialist. Mm -hmm. Well, he says, Bob Spitzer, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I've got this problem. He said, oh, do you want to talk about it? I said, yes, I do. 
So I come into his office and I, I'm telling him, you know, Tom, I said, you know, I know uh, that, uh, you know, this is going to be a problem. And uh, so I said, I'm damaged goods now. I think this is going to be a, a real, you know, degenerative condition. It's going to get worse as time goes on. I may even go blind as I get into my 60s. You know, I, I just want you to know. And he, he's listening to this and he goes, what spirit are you listening to? Because I was busy telling him, now, if you want to let me go right now, it's six mm -hmm. months before ordination, you have time. I totally understand damaged goods, etc. So I'm going through this, and Tom just is looking in complete shock, going, what spirit are you listening to? Right. And that's the question we all have to ask ourselves. As you put it so beautifully, Doug, if the rhetoric is tearing you down, mm -hmm. it is not Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. it is another spirit, mm -hmm. and that spirit is evil indeed, and his whole desire, that mm -hmm. evil spirit's desire, is to basically get you to separate from God, mm -hmm. distrust God, and above all, run from God. And I almost uh, s submitted to pure stupidity. I didn't even listen to, you know, good spiritual direction advice from St. Ignatius right. of Loyola. Okay, here's another question. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, I read a Catholic book on heaven that said all people entering heaven will become 33 years old to match the age of Jesus at death. How was this information determined? What is the benefit of all people in heaven becoming 33 years old? Uh, thank you from Joe. Well, there's no doctrine uh, about that, Joe, I have to tell you. Uh, so, um, but I would say this, uh, in many near-death experience studies, when, for example, both little kids or when adults uh, wind up going to the other side mm -hmm. and they either meet, uh, you know, deceased relatives or deceased friends, uh, when that happens, um, frequently those deceased relatives and friends do look like they're about 30 years old. Mm. So they, it seems to me to, to there is some, some truth to that. Mm -hmm. They do seem to have a very young look. Mm -hmm. This happens a lot with uh, like little kids uh, who, you know, when they, they're asked, you know, well, who met you? Well, it was gr my grandfather. Well, your grandfather died before you were born. I know. Well, and then so they say, well, what did he look like this? And they show him the picture of the older grandfather. Mm. And the older, and he goes, no, no, that's not him. And then they show him another picture and another picture. And finally, they take out, I don't know, the war picture when he mm. was 30 years old or 25 years old. Well, did he look like that? Yeah, that's exactly how he looked. Mm. So that, that happens so often. It's unbelievable uh, in these uh, uh, near-death experiences. Mm. So maybe somebody inferred mm. uh, from near-death experiences that this would happen and people look like they were when they were uh, maybe in their late 20s or 30s, but the, the age of 33, I don't know how they would possibly identify that. They're tying that into course, our Lord, obviously. Right. Yeah, tying yeah. it into our Lord. But uh, alas, I have to tell you, I, I don't think, well, that, that's certainly not doctrinal. Right. And the age of 33 itself is not part of near-death experiences. But the, the thought of you know, people getting younger in the near-death experience, mm. yes, they, they absolutely do. Okay. They, they seem to, I don't say absolutely, but they do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. Dear Father Spitzer, would my prayers for a deceased loved one be wasted if that person, heaven forbid, is condemned to hell? Do you think it's possible that someone in hell can still go to heaven? God bless uh, both of you. Ron from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, Ron, uh, let me answer the second question first. Uh, if somebody is in hell, then they have made a definitive choice to exclude themselves from God, from the kingdom of love, and from the blessed. Mm -hmm. Now, that definitive choice is a forever choice. If so, sometimes you hear that some theologians uh, indicated that the devil who sheds the first tear would be in heaven. Well, that would be the case if a devil would shed a tear, but the devil wouldn't be in hell if he could or would shed a tear. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is that uh, no, um, hell is eternal and um, uh, there's no turning back from it. It's mm -hmm. the definitive decision of the person who chooses to exclude himself mm -hmm. from 
uh, God the blessed and the kingdom of love. Now, with respect to the, the second thing, it's never a waste to pray for anybody because who knows? You know, you, you should never even think about it that way. Remember, God can give, you know, like with respect to the uh, curé of ours, right? right. Uh, um, you know, th this person jumps off a, a bridge and on the way down, this, you know, having committed suicide, he's given this ability to definitively choose as if it's like an hour, you know, but he, he, somehow his brain is, or his mind is operating so quickly that he's able to apprehend that he's being given a choice by God uh, to, to repent of this action or not, mm -hmm. and he chose to repent of that action. And so the curé of ours actually reported back, you know, that he had a vision of, of, of uh, Christ with this man mm -hmm. and just said, he is okay. He was given this uh, uh, ability to choose on the way down as he was mm -hmm. falling, j jumping off this bridge mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, uh, to, to repent of that action. So uh, maybe th it was the prayers of somebody who loved him very much. Maybe it was all the saints in heaven praying for him on the way down. Maybe it was the pure, unconditional heart of God that gave him the chance to repent of that action on the way down. Right. We don't know, but we do know one thing. No prayer is wasted. So if you pray now, God will hear you. Even if you don't pray now, God will still exercise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his, his unconditional mercy and, and, and maybe give people that, that, uh, that chance, especially if they did it in, in a sense of pure uh, depression or despair. We don't know. Right. But the, the, the point is, no prayer is going to be wasted. But hell, it is definitely eternal, and heaven is right. definitely eternal, and purgatory is but for a while. Right. Here's another question, a, a quick one. Dear Father Spitzer, is something that is illegal always a sin? God bless you and all you do, Samantha. This must be an American. This is our perspective, I think. American yeah, perspective well, on the world. Uh, uh, well, actually, no, it's, <laughs> it's not. I mean, most of the time, uh, illegal things are unethical things, but there are plenty of things uh, that are, uh, you know, maybe illegal that are not sinful. For example, there are a lot of traffic laws. Mm -hmm. So let's suppose I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I look around, uh, you know, I'm in a rural stop sign and there's no one for miles and I it sort of do a California stop, which means I come, you know, slowly into the stop sign there and kind continue of, to roll. Know, uh, proceed on through, continue to right. roll on through. Right, right. You know, for all intents and purposes, <laughs> that's not a sin. If you uh, have prudently judged that there's no one you could possibly injure, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So there's all kinds of things like that that, that uh, uh, would be true. But most of the time, mm -hmm. you know, laws are are linked to ethics and ethics is linked to morality and mm -hmm. there is a, a sort of a, a you know you can trace it um, you know there but uh, uh, not, not everything that's mm -hmm. illegal uh, is a sin. Would you say maybe sometime in the past because of the nature of let's say the uh, Christian society in the United States over the years mm -hmm. that in a lot of ways a lot of things were lined up at least in people's minds that it, if something was really a sin it, it should be illegal and now we tend to have mm -hmm. many more things that the church would say, well, this is a sin, but it's perfectly legal. And people get confused over how it could really be bad if it's legal. Yeah, the opposite could yeah. certainly be the case. Um, and and uh, there was a great phrase that, that was once uh, noted, what becomes legal becomes normative. That is mm -hmm. to say, people uh, start doing it. And what becomes uh, uh, normative becomes moral. So mm -hmm. people think, well, because everybody's doing it, it must be moral. Mm -hmm. And so the opposite of the question that right. was just asked is, is really problematic in our culture because right. we do think if not illegal, then not immoral. Right. And that's a logical fallacy uh, called negating the antecedent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you might be able to say if, if legal um, you know, um, well, you can't even say if legal mm -hmm. then moral, uh, but uh, um, uh, or if legal, uh, if, if not uh, illegal, then mm -hmm. not uh, immoral, but you really even can't say that. Right. Uh, yeah, because you could because, have some uh, conscious objection yeah. thing where one might protest sure. something that clearly sure. is a, uh, 
you yeah. know, like an abortion or some other cases like that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So for all intents and purposes, you have right. to basically, uh, you know, both, both sides of the equation are wrong. Right. You can't make a complete, e e you know, equality. Right. But most of the time, you can say that illegal right. things probably are linked to unethical ones, and unethical ones are linked to immoral ones, but n by no means all the time. Okay. Um, and certainly, if things are uh, uh, mandate, uh, not illegal, it doesn't mean right. that they're not immoral, right. uh, because that would equate all uh, ethics, uh, uh, reduce all ethics to the law, and right. we know that that certainly is not the case, uh, for example, in the area of abortion. Right, absolutely. Here's another question. This is one, we must get this question every week, but we finally decided to use it. <laughs> Hi, Father Spitzer. Okay. Hi, Father Spitzer. Since many of the answers you'll provide are quite extraordinary, I think there's no place that you could have read to find those answers. How or where do you go to gain your knowledge? Thanks, Russell. Well, Russell, I... I read a lot of stuff. <laughs> I don't. I, I actually don't read it. I, I, you know, I have to listen to it by various sources uh, today. But I used to read a lot of stuff, and uh, that's that's one method where I got a lot of information. But a lot of it, I just, um, ha you know, when I write my books, I am trying to resolve contemporary problems that have not been clearly resolved hitherto. So uh, I do uh, try to make deductive arguments um, using the best science and using the best philosophy and the best statistics that I can get a hold of. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, there really isn't a past answer and you can, you really have to derive it yourself using good research and logic. Uh, sometimes um, there really is a good answer and you can just happen upon it by doing a lot of research and um, you know um, mm -hmm. I got you know I grew up in a family where I my father had a library mm -hmm. I mean literally I could walk in there and do shelves and shelves and shelves of books you know and I could even you know, pluck a book off the shelf that was about how to build a radio. And the next book, how to establish a prima facie case. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I mean, we had everything in that, mm -hmm. in that darn library. And I, I was a reader, and so I, mm -hmm. I was plucking books uh, from the library, plucking books from the, uh, my father's library mm -hmm. and uh, the school library. And, but of course, my theological studies, the Jesuits, oh, the Jesuits uh, very much helped me. They promoted uh, great education and uh, gave me the time to do the reading and the research right. I needed to do. So, um, you know, it's just where I got the answers. <laughs> right. Well, uh, my, my, my favorite author growing up was Cliff Notes. You remember him. He was very popular <laughs> in high school and in college. Uh, he, I found his work to be highly satisfactory uh, for me. Here's one more question before we go to the break. Hello, Father and Doug. On a previous show, you spoke about the young people not believing in God largely due to science, but there are also seems to be very little understanding of the transcendent and supernatural. Is it possible that is one of the root causes as well? Without a supernatural understanding, the church is reduced to just one of the many belief systems in the world. Thank you, and this is from Guy. Guy, you're absolutely right. Um, there is what we call a reductionistic tendency in this culture, that science has all the answers and like philosophy or theology or spirituality or uh, whatever does not have all the answers. And, and by the way, they, they relegate poetry and literature to the same you know, bin of, of useless subjects uh, oftentimes. But listen to this quite closely. Scientism, which is the reduction of all valid truths to science, is itself a contradiction. It, it, it literally is a self-refuting argument. Now, recall that um, here, here's what scientism holds. All valid truths must be validatable or falsifiable by observable evidence and scientific method, okay? Listen to that word, all. Mm -hmm. All valid truths. Now, a scientific truth can never reach a universal status like all or every or none, right? It can never do that because all science, as I just said, is 
uh, reducible to observable evidence and scientific method, and that pertains always. Every observation I make, every sensory apperception I have is in a particular place and a particular time. Mm -hmm. I can never get to a universal statement like all or every in science. Now listen to this statement once again. All valid truths must be either validatable or falsifiable by science. That proposition with its all is not validatable by science, which can only arrive at particular truths at particular times and particular places. That statement is self-refuting. Mm -hmm. In other words, if the only validatable truth is a scientific truth, well, that truth you just said is not scientifically validatable or falsifiable, mm -hmm. therefore, it's not valid. Your own criterion for scientism refutes itself. That is really noteworthy, guys. So, if, first of all, you are absolutely correct. Scientific reductionism is, is not only self-refuting and a contradiction, but it also ignores half of what we know to be the case. Science can go right after the, the best truths from observable evidence we can get. Mm -hmm. But you know, mathematics is not derived from observable evidence. Mathematics is derived from theoretical evidence, we call it a priori evidence, mm -hmm. that is generated from uh, you know, putting together a series of axioms and theorems through mathematical propositions. We call that a priori truth. Logic itself, the, the, the methodological truths of logic are not uh, scientific truths. They're not groundable in observable evidence. Again, they're a priori knowledge. Mm -hmm. Some metaphysical truths uh, with respect to a, a proof for the existence of God, for example, can have uh, you know, a, a proof in it that, that uh, for example, if you're going to have uh, a multiplicity of anything, you'll have to have a difference between uh, that multi uh, the members of that multiplicity. Now, now that's, you can prove that because if you have no difference between the members of these, uh, you know, of this uh, group of objects, then it's the self-same object. And if it's a self-same object, it's one. It's not a multiplicity. So uh, what my point is, is all these things are not grounded in observation observable evidence, they're grounded in a whole area of truth called a priori evidence. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, the, you know, uh, we leave out math, and of course science is grounded in math, so you leave out one of its, its uh, primary tools uh, by leaving out mathematics itself. Also science is uh, purported to be logical and mm -hmm. is logical, therefore you leave out that tool as well, and you leave out uh, the whole of, of metaphysical uh, propositions, and there are many of them which science uses. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, you know, um, e even the assertion of scientism, of course, uh, you, know, uh, it, it, you know, is at least an allusion to a metaphysical method. So what's the point I'm trying to get to? Mm -hmm. You leave out tons of areas of study. Moreover, scientific truths, even though, you know, you can have statistical, uh, you know, um, uh, structures and quantum mechanics and things of that nature, mm -hmm. uh, you don't deal with people. People are erratic. People have emotions. People have beliefs. They don't operate just by how the protons and electrons in their bodies are operating. Mm -hmm. They're making choices all the time, you know, that, that, that are absolutely unpredictable according to physical processes. I refer you to the book I mentioned last week by David Chalmers that's on the irreducibility of the human subjective experience and self-consciousness to physical processes. The point I'm getting to is, is that all that domain mm -hmm. of self-reflectivity, all the domain of, of human freedom and human choice and human emotion, all of that is ruled out because mm -hmm. science doesn't deal with that. Science can't account for that. You, you can't put it in statistical algorithms uh, or, or, or certainly not definitive algorithms or, or even in chaos, uh, non-algorithms. You, you can't do any of that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's, the, you know, that's another problem. And then you've got another huge area. You know those five transcendental desires? 
Science only deals with one part of one transcendental awareness that we have, and that's truth. And it only deals with the observably groundable, mathematically analyzable parts of truth. It doesn't deal with any of the areas of truth that I just talked about. But what about love? Our awareness of perfect love, our awareness of perfect goodness and conscience and our, our, our moral reasoning. What about beauty and aesthetics? I mean, all of these things are not grounded. Right. You can say, well, beauty is grounded in observable evidence. You cannot explain the apperception of beauty by referring to electrons, fields, quantum fields, anything. Science it can't touch beauty. It can't touch love. Oh, you can say, these chemicals emerged in the brain when these kinds kinds of uh, feelings uh, were, were present, or this part of the brain was stimulated. But do you think you're really giving a definition of love? Do you really think you're giving a definition not only of the feeling or sentiment, but the actual empathy that you have with another human being, that, that, that sympathetic vibration with another human being that, that leads you to the point where you see the good in, in the other and, and, and becomes easier to do the good for them than mm -hmm. to do the good for yourself? Uh, to, do you think that this is reducible to a physical process? I dare say it is not. And do you think that conscience, do you think that uh, you know some, a, a moral proposition like abortion is wrong or murder is wrong or whatever is wrong, do you think that that is reducible to a scientific? Give me the scientific test for that. Give me the scientific test for justice. Give me, you know, that's why, you know, for all intents and purposes, Plato thought the atomists who are just out of, you know, just nuts, because of course he said, well, wait a minute, if all reality is, is reducible to atoms, what about justice, which is clearly not reducible to some kind of a, a physical apparatus? Uh, well, what do you think about justice? Yet at the same time, I can tell you one thing. If you tell me what's the most important characteristic about Joe that you can see, I'll tell you one thing. It's not his electrons. It's not his protons. It's not the constituents of his body. It's not his anatomy. It's not his brain physiology. It's not the process he's going on in his brain. It's whether or not Joe is a just person. But if you can't look under the microscope and see some justice if you can't take all of our great you know uh, scientific and we have many scientific instruments that can diagnose many things about physical processes we just can't diagnose whether justice is there I can put all the electrodes in your brain that I can possibly muster up and I'm not going to get one single little chunk of justice you know measured on that scale and so Plato says you know what will science would be if Plato was around for contemporary science he would have said it's bereft of justice it's bereft bereft of conscience and goodness and the knowledge of morality and, and it's bereft of love and empathy it's bereft of transcendence and God and religion and the spiritual life it's bereft of, of the truths that 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 uh, observable evidence cannot mm -hmm. uh, get to like mathematical truths etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you know, what are we talking about here? Right. You know, I mean, science, yeah, it's not, the knowledge cannot be reduced to science. That, 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 it's not only self-refuting, it, it's like giving yourself a frontal lobotomy and, and frankly, you know, a lobotomy of nine-tenths of your brain and, of course, 100% of your soul, practically. Wow. So why would you do that? And, Guy, your instincts are completely correct. Don't do that. Wow. Don't ever believe that propaganda. You will not only become a half a man, you'll wind up becoming one one millionth of a man. Okay. And, and, and that, that would be pitiful indeed. All right. Very good, Father Spitzer. That was good. I think you uh, showed us some of that knowledge that you've acquired over the years in all those books you've been reading in, in <laughs> one, one healthy dose right there. But we, 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 we killed our break. We're going to stay doing questions here. <laughs> Uh, okay. in our first week of Advent here. Dear Father Spitzer, I've always wondered why God created a world that seems to be designed to kill human beings, whether that's by natural disaster, diseases, or other predatory animals, especially if human beings are made in the image of God. Were the animals originally designed to be predatory towards human beings, or did they become that way after the fall of man? And this is another mic. This one's from Montana. Okay, Mike, I just want to uh, answer the first premise that God designed the world to kill human beings. No, he didn't. God designed the world so that human beings could live. The most extraordinary thing about this world 
is that it will create a habitat favorable to humanity. It is extraordinary. Do you know the odds against this happening? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the, the Penrose number is, and then we'll go from there. The odds against it are 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 120th to 1, just to have a low entropy universe like ours where we can have a habitat where human beings can live. 10 to the 10 to the 120th, that's a 10, and in a single exponent expression, that would be in the exponent, a 1 followed by 120 zeros. A trillion, 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 trillion. Now, if that really is the odds against low entropy, and we need low entropy just to have a habitat that, that like ours uh, to, to manage, that's the odds of a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare by random tapping of the keys in a single try. And the story doesn't end there. It mm -hmm. ends with a bunch of other things. I mean, the, the, the odds against having a livable habitat like our Earth mm -hmm. are not just 10 to the 10 to the 120th. It's 10 to the 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 120th. And uh, all I can tell you is it's, it's the odds of not just a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare by random mm -hmm. tapping other keys in a single try, but the monkey typing the entire corpus of, of the English language in mm -hmm. random tapping of the keys in a single try flawlessly. This, this is just ridiculous. Of course, you know, th th we, are, we are living in the most extraordinary place in the world, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the world, extraordinary place in reality, mm -hmm. namely a world that can sustain our habitat. That's the first thing. The second thing, though, is God has allowed some things to be predatory uh, to human existence to come into the world. That is true. And to, to be predatory to other uh, existence. He has, we call it, let's say, God's permissive will. And he does this actually in the design of the universe for well, several basic reasons. I'm just going to uh, uh, cite a few of them here. But if you want, uh, look at a book that I wrote called um, uh, 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 The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming Suffering Through Faith, Chapter 10. Mm -hmm. I have a whole bunch of these things. But the number one reason that God uh, allows these kinds of things to happen is because God wants us to need one another. We will have to form ourselves into a human community. Hmm. We are not self-sufficient. It is the challenges of this world and the vulnerabilities that this world presents that help us to turn to one another, not just in human parenting and family, though certainly that, but in human societies and cultures. Human beings are constantly together because they can fend better off, you know, some of the dangers uh, that, that besiege them uh, better in community than they can outside of community. The second thing that you, you have to remember, by the way, in all that I'm saying, in, in all this, God is calling us to eternal life through this world. Death is not the end of it all. And, and so you can't say that a predatory thing is contrary to God's plan. Death is not contrary to God's plan. Death is definitely put into God's. He could have made you an immortal. He could have made you an angel. He could have made you a, a creature that would never die like the elves in Tolkien's works. But he didn't. And what did he do? He made you in a way that would call, that would have death. And we call that being toward death. That that's what calls us to, you know, to, to live for something, uh, you know, important with our lives. It, it, it tells us, uh, it, you know, that, uh, by the way, he gives us an intuition that we have an afterlife. And as I was saying in, in last week's program, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, human beings have known this for 70,000 years that there was an afterlife. They didn't get it by sheer logical reasoning. God gives them an intuition of that afterlife, and they have followed that assiduously uh, for over 70,000 years. My point, though, is this is death is not the end of it all. Death is the call to do something significant with your life, to form your true identity and your freedom, who you really are, before you leave this world. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you leave this world as a good person, and you know, cultures know this, going all the way back 70,000 years, you leave this world as a good person, something good will happen in mm -hmm. the afterlife. You leave it as an evil person, something evil will happen in the afterlife. This is not just a Christian or Judeo-Christian teaching. Mm -hmm. This goes way back before that. So the idea of good and evil and good and evil following mm -hmm. you into the next life, that is absolutely uh, an insight, intuition that, Jesus, that God gives us. 
The third thing to remember, too, is we need challenges in our own lives, right? We need to overcome challenges in order to find our courage, in order to test our mettle. We can't just live in a utilitarian bubble where, you know, uh, we say, okay, need food, and poof, God provides in the bubble a oh, sumptuous feast right there for old Bobby. Hmm. And then uh, need more pleasure, and God says, is here, Ferris wheel, and gives it to Bobby, mm -hmm. and then need more whatever, and, mm -hmm. and it just co comes out, and there's no suffering, anything like that. In fact, what we need in order to call us out of superficiality, in order to call us to a, a higher life and a higher purpose, in order to call us to something noble and worthy of ourselves, even worthy of self-sacrifice, like doing something for the love of our children, or fighting for our country, or fighting for an ideal that really matters, or being a martyr for the sake of the kingdom of God. These are noble ideals, but they come about by the fact that suffering really is a possibility. And, and so we, we need these things, not just for the noble effort, but even to shock us out of superficiality. St. Paul tells us, we need suffering in order to, to have the humility that is requisite for, for really true love, to get beyond our ego. And, and he says, in my weakness is my strength. I, I, given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. And, 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 and now I know that in my weakness is my strength. As I grow weaker, Christ grows stronger in me. I'm heading toward salvation. I'm being purified in love. I'm becoming more like Jesus Christ in, in love and in his heart. And, and as a consequence, consequence, I'm leading other people to God, and I'm leading other people beyond their egos, and we're all going to get into that community of love if we actually follow the impetus mm -hmm. of suffering, follow the impetus of the cross, and following the impetus of death. So Jesus basically put this in our lives for our sake, too, and that's why he came down into the world and shared our suffering. He didn't take it away. Mm. He came into the world, and he showed showed us what to do with our suffering. He sh showed us the opportunities that lie in our suffering for getting beyond our ego, for serving humanity, mm -hmm. for empathizing and having compassion for others, for becoming humble, and for deepening our faith and becoming vulnerable and for letting God mm -hmm. in in the moment of those sufferings and, 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 and countless other things, and above all, how to offer it up for the sake of other people so that that suffering becomes self-sacrificial love that the Father can give to anybody who wants it. So all of these purposes are in God's plan. Mm -hmm. Suffering is not something that is antithetical to love. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. Suffering is truly hand in hand with love, but you need faith. Mm -hmm. Suffering without faith can turn you inward, embitter you, and, and, and really not only make your life help, but help you to make everybody else's life mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in, in the same vein. So for all intents and purposes, what, what we say about suffering is suffering plus faith, mm -hmm. uh, is suffering plus that trust in God to, 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 to follow him and in, in that suffering and to let him lead you, mm -hmm. that will produce the kingdom of heaven and it will purify you like St. Paul in humility and in love so that you can lead other people authentically to heaven and that's the highest purpose you can have because heaven is eternal and so is hell. And so we definitely want that suffering. Right. I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to look back and I'm going to go, Whew, thank God I was blind. And thank God I got this. And thank God I had that challenge. Because without those things, I probably would have been in my own little pleasure bubble, my <laughs> own little hedonistic bubble. And of what good would have come mm -hmm. from that? I would have never even known about my mettle or my courage, let alone about virtue and, and trying to you know, uh, decrease and, 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 and get beyond my egocentricity and my pride. I, I wouldn't have even had a faith. I, I, would I have even called upon God? Would I have called upon anybody else to help me? Would I have ever wanted to help anybody else in empathy and compassion? I know not, but I know one right. thing, suffering enhanced it all right. through my faith. And Certainly. so that's why I think 
God right. puts us in a challenging world. Right, and that's one of the great insights I think that the Catholic faith has and, and for people who come mm -hmm. into it is, to, is that understanding of, of suffering and redemptive suffering and that suffering is never mm -hmm. wasted uh, in that mm -hmm. way. So here's, a, uh -huh. we've got another couple of quick questions since we're, we're not sure. going to bother getting into our topic. We'll, we'll save that for <laughs> next time. Uh, dear okay. Father Spitzer, do the fallen angels love each other or is that an impossibility? Thank you, Teresa from Tabernacle, New Jersey. Interesting town, Tabernacle. Uh, yeah, Teresa, the fallen angels do not love each other. Mm. I can assure you of that. Oh, they experience a camaraderie in their evil, but this is not love. Mm -hmm. If you mean by love, seeing the good in the other, whereby you create a unity with mm -hmm. the other, uh, such that um, loving or, or giving yourself or doing the good for the other is right. just as easy, if not easier, than doing the good for yourself. I assure you, the fallen angels are doing nothing of that kind. The, the, what the um, uh, fallen angels have is a camaraderie. Uh, they have a joint cause, which is called right. the undermining of love, the undermining of God, and the undermining of you. There is no love in them, and that's why they are dark, mm. fearful, horrible beings, and we should want to avoid Beautiful. them right. and want to avoid the lifestyle that they're promoting at all mm. costs because what they really want to do is to bring you into their domain forever and s seduce you, convince mm. you that they have the answer in evil Stick with Christ Jesus our Lord. Stick with his path to salvation and love. Stick with what he said about morality mm -hmm. and stick above, uh, above all else with the Catholic Church who interprets that right. and you're gonna be just fine. But no, no, the fallen angels don't love. They just have a peculiar camaraderie in hate. Mm -hmm. Another question, dear Father Spitzer, what is the relationship between the dead and the living? Do the dead attempt to communicate with us? Do they send us signs? Are the dead near us at times? How would we know if they're trying to contact us? This is Marilyn from New Rochelle, New York. Uh, Marilyn, uh, the dead, uh, well, uh, some of the dead actually go to heaven. Um, do some of the dead try to contact us uh, before uh, they go to heaven? Um, I would say that there certainly are a lot of recorded instances of what's called, you know, um, uh, post-mortem visions, you know, of, of people who appear to people, of course, mm -hmm. post-mortem apparitions of people who are dead. And there are some cases where people identify features uh, of a person that they did not know were there uh, prior to the death, and then when the um, when they describe the person and go, oh, how did you know that? They were, uh, you know, miles away and they had this accident or mm -hmm. something of that nature and uh, people know. So I, I don't know, but I, I would say uh, overall, I, I do think that there are post-mortem apparitions mm -hmm. of, of uh, um, people who have just died. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly, I, I think, uh, can be justified with some kind of, you know, testimonial warrant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had an interesting instance, uh, you know, in my own life, you know, when my mother died, we mm -hmm. always, when we went to the Outrigger, I grew up in Hawaii and there was a club called the Outrigger Canoe Club. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and as you were looking out toward the ocean, from that club, you, you could actually, um, every once in a while, very rarely, there would be what, what people would call this green, <clears throat> you know, uh, flash that would occur right at sunset. But it was pretty rare. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we'd always, every time we went as a family there, you know, we'd say, well, maybe there'll be a green flash. Invariably, there was not a green flash. But, you know, once out in a blue moon, <clears throat> there'd be a green flash. So my mother died, and my sister said, uh, you watch. Tonight there will be a green flash. Uh, wow. This is after the funeral, and uh, you know there was a. We had this little reception at the, the Outrigger Canoe Club, and um, we were all looking, you know, toward the horizon, and kablamo! 
it was the biggest green really? flash we had ever seen. And I just thought, Mom? You know, I mean, literally, uh, I mean, uh, but, you know, that's not a post-mortem apparition, but right. it, was, it was kind of funny. I, I do think also there are ghosts in the world. I mm -hmm. think those ghosts are the presence of people who have not moved on for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, they are still dealing with something in this world. Uh, you know, Peter Kreef calls them purgatorial. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a ghost so that could be, uh, the, the, you know, whatever the case may be, they are ghosts uh, and they certainly manifest themselves. And uh, oftentimes, though, the ones that are here are very much haunted. Uh, they're, they're, they're very much living in an unresolved issue, mm -hmm. dealing with their own suicide, or oftentimes they can be malevolent. Mm -hmm. So those would not be ghosts from purgatory. Those would be ghosts from hell. Mm -hmm. And so my, my one thought is be very careful, uh, you know, trying to communicate or do anything with any kind of a ghost uh, at all. Just don't do it, you know, just say, uh, well, Mom, if that's you, uh, right. thanks for coming. End of story. Right. Don't 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 do anything more. Do not try to communicate. Do not do anything like that. I tell you, the devil has a billion faces, and he can come just like your mother. Mm -hmm. And I've cited this before, the Robbie Mannheim exorcism. Mm -hmm. He thought he was dealing with his spiritualist aunt who had died. Mm -hmm. He got out his Ouija board to try and conjure her up. The Ouija board convinced him that it was his aunt. Mm -hmm. But in point of fact, it was not his aunt, but it was a very malevolent uh, uh, spirit, a, a diabolical spirit, you know, right. that, that took, I think, 38 times through the exorcism exorcism right uh, over the course of a month uh, to, to get that poor right. boy, uh, uh, you know, exercised and healed. But uh, you cannot believe what took place in that right. exorcism. Uh, by the way, um, I have it on uh, the uh, summary of that exorcism on, on my website, CredibleCatholic.com. Right. Just click on the big book and then go to uh, volume um, right. 14. Very good. And there you'll see the exorcism right. of Robbie Manheim. And we will be closing the big book for this week because we're just out of time. So Father, if you'll give <laughs> us your blessing, that would be great. Absolutely. Please bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord of all love, mercy, and consolation come upon you and tell you of the wisdom of his law, his goodness, his moral, his moral teachings, and tell you also of the, uh, the salvation that awaits you in his compassion, of the salvation that awaits you as you overcome your ego into the heart of his love, and bless you through that into your salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you so much, Father. We shall see you next week. And we okay, God thank bless you, all, you all for joining us here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Don't forget about uh, my bookmark show with the Christ of Jesus from the cross. It's a Fulton Sheen anthology with Alan Smith. And of course, Fulton Sheen, December 21st is going to be his beatification. And I guarantee we're going to be carrying that event. So look for that. And also remember next week, we'll be talking about the Eucharistic commemoration in the first century. We'll finally get into that. Much more ahead, week by week, as we move through Advent. This is Father Spitzer's universe. He's in control. We'll see you next time.